giving broken down uh, helicopters and giving real helicopters, and between that and Vietnam, you're really not doing very much creative thinking about this conflict. Um, but we put the Blackhawks in there, and yes, we got the votes of, of Chris Dodd, a senator, a very liberal senator from Connecticut. And people said, how did you get Dodd's vote? And I said, well, did you notice the Blackhawks? Where, where are they made? Uh, well, they're made in Connecticut. And I said, exactly. I said, if they made guillotines in Connecticut, they'd be in this bill, too. Uh, but at any rate, it, it, it was a bipartisan effort. The President uh, Clinton stepped up to the plate, overrode the advice of some of his uh, uh, senior diplomats and said, no, we're going to do this. Colombia needs that investment. By the way, uh, people like Joe Biden uh, were in the Senate at, the t at, the, at that time, too, and, and were supportive. Uh, of that effort and, and, and goes back a long, his engagement goes back a long time on these issues. So that was an important, you know, at the point, at that point, uh, when we were putting that legislation together, which eventually would give the Colombians the capacity, along with their own commitment of additional resources for national security, to put those guerrillas for the first time in years back on their heels to claim back territory and with the leadership of uh, then President Alvaro Uribe uh, uh, implementing a democratic security plan that projected the presence of the state into areas of the country that were essentially abandoned to these guerrillas. Uh, and it, it was a Herculean effort on the part of a lot of, of, of Colombians who made that sacrifice and yes, raised taxes on themselves to invest in that struggle. But the American people, deserve some credit for that. We eventually, that became a $10 billion investment over 10 years. And we're now uh, doing what we, uh, what we can uh, to consolidate those benefits. Frankly, uh, the, the, the pitch that the, that the Colombians are making now about investment in their oil and gas sector is absolutely critical because they need the revenue uh, to sustain good policies that will uh, secure uh, parts of their country give the benefits of economic growth uh, to people from all walks of life in Colombia. So that's uh, uh, really the purpose of, of our discussion here, and, and I'm pleased that I was able to be part of that. And then as Assistant Secretary a few years later, Hugo Chavez, you guys probably still remember Hugo Chavez, um, uh, he was always threatening to cut off oil to the United States. And I was Assistant Secretary, and and was surprised to see that Colombia's oil production had actually been reduced uh, in, for, you know, from 10 years earlier. We had hit a trough and it was underperforming. So I asked our people, why don't we get private sector folks together to recommend what would be their checklist uh, to reactivate that energy sector, to make it attractive to U.S. investment and in, in, uh, investment of other, other countries. Uh, and unlock that great potential and generate revenue and, and more importantly, become a source of energy uh, for the United States where we can establish that good partnership. And we came up with that checklist. Uh, a colleague of mine at the Energy Department, Karen Harbert, uh, presided over that effort, came up with that list uh, of items, and we took it to uh, President Uribe, a very you know, extraordinarily impressive man, uh, and he would sit there kind of quietly uh, and, and said, Ambassador Noriega, may I start the conversation? I, yes, Mr. President, it's your country. And then I handed the list. Of, These are the things that we think you really need to do to unlock the potential of your economy. And he took that list essentially and made it a checklist. In the subsequent meetings with President Bush, uh, President Uribe would give his report card on the things they did. And they unlocked the potential of that economy. They, they increased uh, production significantly precisely because of those of those things. So here I am again asking for the help for, of the American people for Colombia, but not as a charity, but as a good investment in our shared security and in good neighbors who represent a bulwark really in South America today. Uh, and they're confronting a couple of challenges. Yes, the guerrillas are still there. Uh, they are now living in the hospitality of Nicolas Maduro in Venezuela. Work operating with complete impunity in in, 
in the cocaine business as well as in the smuggling of illegal gold. Uh, and as they, uh, as they wish, terrorizing the Colombian people as well, along with the Venezuelan people. And so that threat is one that's right on Colombia's border, and it can't confront it alone. It will need resources to protect their national security and, and territorial integrity, defend their people. Uh, and uh, that's what the investment in the oil and gas sector will in part sustain along with medical care and housing and, 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 all of the, and, and education and all the things that, that Colombian people of all walks of life uh, deserve. So we can be a good partner. And because of that common threat that we, uh, in Venezuela, I think we, this is another time where we cannot evade responsibility uh, in that part of, uh, of, of the Americas. Thank you, Ambassador Noriega. So now, Jason, we go uh, uh, with your uh, intervention, initial intervention. Thank you, Jason. Right. Well, well, thank you. Thanks, first of all, to uh, Vision America's Rice University World Affairs Council. Uh, great to participate, uh, albeit virtually. Uh, and, and Roger, great to be on the panel with you and Richard.